Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to tonight's discussion event. Um, I'm Claire O'Dowd. I'm research curator at the Henry Moore Institute. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all to the latest in our series of events on the theme of fabrication, uh, which we've developed in collaboration with Pangea's Sculpture Centre uh, and which will run until the end of July. So over the last few weeks, uh, we've been discussing this theme with artists and fabricators in order to demystify some of the practical aspects of how sculpture is made. We've talked about how to get into fabrication as a career, how to move between the two roles of artist and fabricator, and about how artists work with fabricators and how those relationships and collaborations are developed. Uh, you can find recordings of our previous events on the Henry Moore Institute website, on the Pangea Sculpture Centre website, and also on our YouTube channel. And tonight, Lucy Tomlins from Pangea is with us to talk a little bit more about Pangea and what they do, and to talk us through the Zoom housekeeping rules for the evening. Thanks, Claire. Hi, everybody. Um, we're really pleased to have developed this season of talks with the Henry Moore Institute. Fabrication is such an instrumental part of the ecology of sculpture, and yet so often the importance of the role it plays, the relationship between artist and fabricator and different approaches to this engagement gets overlooked. For those of you that don't know the work of Pangea Sculpture Centre, we are a community interest company founded in 2013. We facilitate the production of innovative sculpture and develop critical cultural and educational programming around the art form. <clears throat> we offer art consultancy, technical and fabrication services, with all proceeds from this activity reinvested into our non-profit initiatives. The organisation supports contemporary sculptors and aims to remove barriers of entry into the profession. PSC is artist and female-led, committed to addressing structural inequalities and to a more diverse and equitable art ecology. So far in the talks programme, we focus on some of the more practical aspects of fabrication. Today's round table will see, we'll see us change tack somewhat to something perhaps a little more philosophical with three fantastic speakers whose post-conceptual practices and the ways they engage with new and perhaps old technologies dissolve any distinction between process and practice. Before I hand back to our chair, Dr. Claire O'Dowd, some general Zoom housekeeping. For those that need them, subtitles can be turned off and on by clicking the live transcript button on the bottom toolbar, the one with the CC symbol on it. If at any point your video freezes or you are having connection issues, we recommend restarting Zoom and you can rejoin using the same link. Questions and comments can be submitted using the chat function, which can be found on the bottom toolbar. If you want us to mention your name, please include it in the message, otherwise we will keep it anonymous. Okay, thanks Lucy. Um, so, as Lucy said, tonight's theme is new technologies. Um, and sculpture has always been a field that invites experimentation and engagement with te emerging technologies. And we can take this right the way back to the invention of the pointing machine in ancient Greece. This has been going on for a long time. Um, so the histories of sculpture are also often histories of technologies and the ways in which artists have adopted them. So this evening, we're joined by three amazing artists who have embraced different forms of technology uh, and who all use them in very different ways. Um, so Alice Channer, um, Alice describes her work as 21st century process art, um, and she aims to make different processes more visible within her work. Alice uses a huge range of materials, um, including crab shells and ammonites, stainless steel, limestone, recent <coughs> pellets, pleated silk, um, and her sculptures stretch out or speed up different production processes, industrial, post-industrial, and natural. And those processes include 3D mapping and printing, as well as sand casting and industrial coatings. Alice's work traces the disappearance, mutation, and possible evolution of multiple bodies. Um, and the idea of bodies in this context is definitely something that we're gonna talk more about tonight. 
Um, Alice is exhibited widely nationally and internationally and her work can currently be seen as part of the Liverpool Biennial and also at the Large Glass in London. Daniel Stiegman Mangrane is um, tonight joining us from Rio de Janeiro, where he's been based since 2004. Danny's research focuses on biological processes and anthropological discourse, um, and his sculptures and installations dissolve the distinctions between the traditional binaries of culture and na nature, subject and object, reality and dream, visible and invisible. Danny's work often involves multiple processes from scanning and modeling to 3D printing and virtual reality. His work has been shown in galleries and museums across the world. And at the moment, it can also be seen in Liverpool as part of this year's biennial, although not by Danny himself. Uh, and I hope we can talk more about that shortly. And finally, Zachary Eastwood Bloom. Zach uses a range of media and processes in his work, including sculpture, video, dance, sound, photography, and drawing to explore human progress and the ways in which humans attempt to understand the world around them. Zach first began to explore digital technologies during his MA in ceramics and glass at the Royal College of Art. And since then he's used digital processes in combination with more traditional materials particularly during his recent period as an artist in residence at the Scottish Ballet, where he used motion capture and digital effects to create a series of short films. And Zach's currently working on a research project exploring artificial intelligence and marine machine learning in relation to sculptural aesthetics, which I'm really looking forward to hearing more about. So this evening, um, we've asked <coughs> all of our participants to um, prepare a short presentation about their work so that we can learn more about what they do before we plough into questions and discussion. Um, so first of all, I'd like to invite Alice Channer uh, to share her screen and tell us more about her work. Hello, everybody. I'm Alice Channer. I'm talking from my home in South East London, uh, where it's just after 6 p.m. Thank you to Claire and Lucy, to HMI and Pangea for hosting this discussion, and to my fellow, fellow panelists, Daniel and Zachary. Special thanks to everyone in the audience for being with us tonight. I can't see you, but I can feel that you're there. My work is a kind of 21st century process art. By this, I mean that I work with industrial and natural processes, forms, and materials over long periods of time to find forms within them that I can develop as sculpture. Every work I make, including the one that's on the screen at the moment, has pleated surfaces that hold within them records of its multiple births, much like the folded and scarred surfaces of our own skins. Over the last decade, I've been imaginatively documenting the production of my sculptural work. This has led to artist books, collaborative sound works, one of which, First Birth, a new audio work by Shell Like, accompanies my group of works across two floors of the Lewis Building as part of the current Liverpool Biennial, and more recently video. When I talk about my work, I usually talk about how it's made, Process is still little spoken of, and we don't have enough language for it. I often think of a quote by the philosopher Rosie Bray Dotti. She says, if the only constant at the dawn of the third millennium is change, then the challenge lies in talking about processes rather than concepts. For this talk, I'm gonna talk briefly about how, how I've used 3D scanning and printing and CNC in combination with multiple other processes, forms and materials to make several sculptures. And I'll talk also about how the politics of materiality manifested by my sculptures relates to this theme of new technologies. I was surprised to be asked to contribute to this discussion because although my work is a kind of process art, it does not involve any kind of mastery. It's not my job to be an expert in process or technology. It is my job to say what it feels like. Western capitalist culture often mistakes technological prowess for wisdom, and in my work I'm critical of that. My work articulates the effects of industrial and technological processes upon multiple bodies, a 
and I'll now talk a little bit more about this. One of the effects that I manifest, one of the effects upon bodies that I manifest in my work is stretching. The images on the screen now show a sculpture that involves stretching multiple bodies. Basic use of digital technologies such as 3D scanning, 3D printing and CNC allows me to stretch objects. Sculptures I've made in the last 10 years stretch the bodies of bones, fingers, rocks and brambles using these processes. I don't think these technologies are particularly new, but access to them, especially at scale, is. When a body stretches, it's in transformation and but it could also be breaking. I want to show what this feels like. Imagine your bones stretching. To me, this feels both ecstatic and potentially painful. In my pair of sculptures, both titled, titled Ammonite and currently on display at Liverpool Biennial, I stretched plastic models of human femur bones to mega fauna proportions. Stretching also makes multiple processes and forms visible in the surface and skin of the sculptures, which you can see in these images of megaflora that are on the screen at the moment. I do not understand size, but I do understand scale. And the capacity of these technologies to stretch objects has given me a means to negotiate monumentality on my own terms. The image on the screen at the moment is of a new sculpture, Megaflora. Megaflora is currently on display as part of a solo show at Large Glass in London. Next, I'll talk through a sequence of images that show some of Megaflora's multiple births. As we look at these images, think back to the images of the finished work and the way the multiple processes remain visible in its skin. So this image shows a 10 centimetre section of bramble being prepared for a 3D scan. It's a small 10 centimetre section of a very peripheral plant, um, a weed, some people would describe this plant as. So I'm thinking a lot about scale and how it relates to hierarchies of value. The tiny stickers which the scanner uses as orientation points remain visible in the final cast as a memory of this process. Here you can see light from the 3D scanner. Here you can see digital ma manipulation and stretch. We stretch the file from 10 centimetres to 330 centimetres. Here you can see CNC. I asked the person programming the machine to make the marks horizontal. The final marks are sculptural carving marks authored by several machines, a machine operator, a programmer, a client, and an artist. These marks are also a kind of touch. Marks from these authors and bodies, human and non-human, are visible in the surface of the final work. I should say that many artists use this process to enlarge forms, but the marks from the process are usually obscured in the final works. I want to make what I would call honest surfaces and forms that tell the stories of their multiple births. You will have seen from the images of the finished Megaflora sculpture, for example, that the sculpture is hollow. All monumental casting is hollow, but this is usually obscured by a smooth and continent skin. The body of Megaflora, like all of our bodies, reveals its processes and hollow centre. So here are some really beautiful images of the sand moulding and sand casting process. These are industrial processes with ancient roots close to how the first metal arrowheads and jewellery were made. This image shows the interior of the mould. It looks to me like the inside of a bone, another bodily resonance. Here you can see the mould, the sand mould, after the metal has been poured in. Here you can see the final form being exhumed and born from the sand mould. This image is primordial and I often find primordial forms within industrial processes. This is important as my, I want my work to hold within it different kinds of time. The questions that I'm asking by making these objects a sculpture and asking you to encounter them in body are, at what point might a body be stretched too far? At the point that the skin starts to rupture or the earth starts to break? And what would that feel like? Here are images of Megaflora currently on show at large glass. In the surface of the cast, the sticker from the 3D scanning process the marks from the sections of the sand mould, which we just saw, the lines from the CNC, which we also just saw, and the organic form of the bramble are all visible, multiple bodies. 
So like all of my work, Megaflora is figurative sculpture. I want to expand the category of figurative sculpture to include multiple bodies. Here are some images of another work, Planetary System from 2019. In the context of this discussion, I would like to emphasize that no tool, no technology, no material, no process, no form is neutral. Also, a note on gender and the politics of working with these industrial machines and their war against bodies. These processes are patriarchal. They are written and built in the surface of capitalism. As artists, when we work with them, we come up against this. It's part of the material and language of our work, whether we acknowledge that or not. We should not forget in our discussion that these technologies are death machines engaged in a war with living bodies and that our work with them can be part of an asymmetric attack back against them. I will say again, these processes are not neutral and should not be treated as such. I do not experience my work or practice as linear and I reject the linear narratives of progress that accompany new technologies. Instead, I'm trying to make work that includes different kinds of time. This is what the geologist Marsha Bjarnerud calls polytemporal thinking, the ability to hold past, present and future time in the mind concurrently. Alongside this incredible word polytemporal, here are images of my 2016 sculpture, Burial, which uses a similar production process to Megaflora and the pair of Ammonite sculptures to stretch rocks. An outdoor version of this will soon be on display as part of sculpture in the city in the city of London. So I'm going to finish um, with another Marsha Bjarnerud quote and the images of my 2018 sculpture, Elon Musk, which I thought was especially appropriate given the theme of the discussion. She writes, many of the environmental problems we face are a result of the failure in the early 20th century to anticipate how new technologies, the internal combustion engine, chemical fertilizers, antibiotics, plastics, would react over time with complex evolving natural systems. An unfortunate reality is that the unintentional consequences of our technologies will almost always outlive our intentional implementation of them. So this quote sums up the position of complication and of material complicity from which I'm working and my relation to the theme of new technologies. Thanks. Thanks, Alice. That was amazing. It's really fascinating to see how the work develops and how also how you think about the technology, which we will definitely come back to shortly. Um, Daniel, can we have your screen share and see some of your work too, please? Sure. So, well, first of all, uh, good evening to everyone and thank you for, to you, Claire and Lucy, for the invitation uh, to this panel. Uh, I'm very flattered uh, being part of it and I really hope I can contribute to the discussion and give some insights uh, on my way of working with new technologies uh, or any kind of technology, actually. But... Um, so um, I have to say that I started working in a very traditional way, as you can see in the, in the image uh, on the screen, um, working basically alone in the studio and doing everything with my own uh, hands. But um, at the same time, I also felt the urge uh, always uh, to do things I don't know how to do. Um, this had led me to make a lot of mistakes, of course, but also led me to work with amazing people who um, not only uh, know how to do what, uh, whatever I wanted to do at a given moment, but also had their own creativity, culture and intelligence to find solutions I could never have encountered by myself. Um, for this introduction, uh, I would like to focus on three different projects. Uh, Phantom, Kingdom of All the Animals and All the Best is my name. La Pense Feral, which is just opened on the Liverpool Biennial last week. Uh, and A Dream, Dreaming a Dream. I chose these three different projects 
because all of them share the use of the less, less available technologies to think about nature and our relationship to it. Phantom was commissioned by Lauren Cornell for her new museum, Triennial. It's a virtual reality work uh, based on a laser scan of a portion of the Brazilian Mata Atlantica rainforest, which has been one of my main sources of inspiration. As you can see in the clip, Phantom uses tracking technologies to position the viewer and render their movements in the virtual world credible. Uh, we, we all have a very, very precise proper perception system that tells yourself where uh, and where you are and how your body is moving in the space. So if the virtual reality uh, space, the virtual real world doesn't react exactly to your movements, you get sick, uh, modern sick very, very quickly. You know? uh, what today is pretty much an off the shelf uh, technology, uh, consumer technology was still a very much a developer's prototype in 2015. So actually no one had a really clear idea if this will work uh, as we wanted. Uh, but thanks to have Lauren Cornell, uh, amazing commitment and having the new museum behind, we managed to get the support from Oculus directly and OptiTrack, the tracking camera system, who put at our disposal some of the engineers and knowledge. To realize the case, uh, we worked uh, closely with the Scanlab Projects, which is an amazing company uh, based in London, who scanned the rainforest and also wrote the script to make it visible through the headset uh, and integrated it with your track tracking system. Uh, when you put the headset, you are very, at first very seduced by the image of the rainforest uh, itself, which is uh, at the same time very abstract just made of these dots of light you're seeing on the screen, um, but at the same time, very realistic with all the complexity and volumetric detail of a real forest. Um, so it's pretty clear at the same time that there's a, like a real source that is not like a digital creation or something like that. No, it's just too complex. Um, but the thing is that when you put the glasses, then you quickly realize you can move through the space that you cannot touch anything, and also anything can touch you back. You can transfer the, the, the forest like, a, like the wind. You know? And then you realize you don't have a body. You know? Wherever your body was supposed to be, uh, there's only just a thicket of branches and leaves and, and vines. Um, I thought I'd been very fascinated by the plasticity of the, of the, of the result of the, of the scan itself. Um, and I've been thinking uh, how to use it uh, anew for the, for, for the last few years. I only had very recently uh, the chance uh, to use this, uh, this uh, very same technology again for two new projects. Um, first, I used it again to do uh, the very, exactly the very same scanning technology, uh, a leader scanner uh, to scan a power ray. A power ray means a king three, uh, which is an endemic three from the Brazilian rainforest, which then was casted, uh, was was uh, so was was uh, scanned, then was sent to Liverpool, where it was 3D printed, then casted, embedded with the eye of uh, from a dog from Bangladesh, and installed in the Crown Park uh, in uh, of, of Liverpool. Um, I want to take the chance actually to, to thank Chris and Cynthia from Castle Foundry, uh, who, despite getting a really bad uh, COVID infection, managed to, to do the, the work amazingly beautiful and, and on time for the opening. Um, well, while I'm still myself uh, thinking what it means to have a menaced rainforest king, at, with a Bangladeshi stray dog eye peering the city from the British Crown Park, I might share an idea. That impressive tree was scanned, dematerialized, metamorphosed, and then materialized again on the other side of the Atlantic, making, making the inverse travel of that of millions of slaves that were traded from Liverpool for centuries. Lastly, I would like to introduce a little animal that come recently to life thanks to the invitation of Soledad Gutierrez to participate in one of the TBR21 stage chapters. 
uh, a dream dreaming a dream is a lonely panther wandering through a dreamlike forest. From time to time, the forest collapses and the panther wakes from, from her dream, just to find herself in the same scenery, which she then starts to wander again, until the dream collapses again, and again, and again, and again, perpetually trapped in a cycle of work and dream. To make, dream, to make a dream dreaming a dream, I worked and still work and actually with a company in Barcelona, Caleb Bassetis, that develops digital contents and environments. Um, we took the, the, the scan, the very same scan of fun from the first work I did, I, I presented, and we placed the, the, the animation of this, uh, of this little photo, of this little panther. But what to me is really important is, the, and I would like to underline here, is that the life of the panther is not prescripted. There's no animation prescriptive. The panther is an artificial intelligence that is constantly and in real time deciding what to do and where to go. This 3D real-time procedural animation is totally autonomous and is actually happening despite anyone accessing the stage website or the world being exhibited anywhere. Which might bring to the digital realm the old ontological question. If a three falls without anyone listening to it, does it make any sound? I believe that the answer is yes. First of all, because the question is badly formulated by putting the humans again at the center of the stage. If a tree is in a forest, the tree is at least surrounded by another tree who will immediately and acutely sense its fall. Secondly, because a forest is not made only of trees, a forest is made of millions of forms of life and non-living agents, constantly interacting and sustaining each other metabolical processes. I cannot think myself of a better metaphor of how the body of work of an artist should be built, how an institution should work, or how society might engage in common well-being. It's in fact a model for a new cultural paradigm, one that instead of separating our knowledge is that everything is entangled. So for me, when using our technology, what is important is not how fancy or advanced it is, but how it changes our understanding of ourselves. And that's it. Thanks, Danny. That was, that's amazing. <laughs> My mind is bl being blown by all this work tonight. It's absolutely extraordinary, <laughs> and I can't wait to hear more about that. And I love the question about if a tree falls in the forest. That's a really good <laughs> way of looking at it. Um, and finally, um, Zachary Eastwood Bloom, are you ready to go? I am indeed, yeah. <clears throat> uh, so, hi, folks. Uh, my name is Zach. Uh, Thanks, guys, for having me here. Um, I, I think, as a Yorkshireman, it makes me feel very proud to be asked. So I, I re really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so I've, I've put in a couple of images that kind of provide a bit of context to my kind of practice historically, I suppose. Uh, and it's something that is a kind of undercurrent of, uh, of what is still going on in my practice as well. So I originally uh, studied ceramics. And um, I suppose in my career, I always thought I would uh, just make sculpture out of clay. Um, and at one point during my uh, bachelor's at Edinburgh College of Art, one of the um, tutors recommended that I go to the furniture department because they were using uh, kind of new 3D modeling software. And I had a kind of propensity to make geometric sculpture and it kind of applied uh, to my process very well and it just turns out that that one little piece of kind of advice uh, became a kind of huge kind of fork in the road for me it kind of fundamentally changed everything that I've done ever since and bearing in mind this was in about 2004 so it's quite a while ago um, and from then on that practice became kind of a kind of divergence of kind of hand making uh, site work and digitally preparing uh, a sculpture on a computer. So this this work here, Partition, uh, was for the Jerwood uh, Makers uh, Award back in 2015. And this is a wholly um, ceramic sculpture. Uh, it's about five meters long and two and a half meters high. Um, 
and it didn't involve any digital processes other than it is built in the same way that a um a computer might think about form so it's built in a kind of mesh like structure so i was interested in this kind of kind of dividing line i suppose between what is a kind of material reality and a kind of digital reality you know it's a kind of a, a boundary that we kind of cross uh, on a daily basis but it's kind of a rigid boundary as well that we can't physically cross if that makes sense so that's why this piece is called partition and ceramics is something that has kind of uh, i've continued uh, to work with um over the years and i go through phases actually of where i can spend quite a significant amount of time sat at a computer um kind of developing new work using 3d modeling software but i still get this really physical need to actually have to use materials and make something it's uh, i get I, the way i describe it is i kind of get itchy fingers I, I need to do something uh kind of physically make something to get away almost from that um or exercise that kind of digital kind of stuff from my brain um about uh three or four years ago um i was lucky enough to get a project with a pangolin editions bronze foundry a residency with them a year-long residency where they literally just said uh, propose uh, a body of work you've got a year to develop a body of work and propose that work and if uh, if we like it we'll make it um, and they at the time had set up a new digital department within the foundry and it was something that they wanted to explore and I suppose promote much more fully um, and I uh, started develop developing this body of work which was called Divine Principles uh, and this was a, a process whereby I either 3D scanned or sourced 3D scans of uh, classical uh, gods that represent the planets of the solar system uh, and I then uh, used 3D modeling software to distort those 3D scans uh, with imagery of the actual planets that they represent so on screen here we've got uh, Jupiter on the left and Saturn on the right uh, and they're both distorted from imagery taken from satellites so it's using a two-dimensional image as a mask to um kind of disrupts the surface of the model uh, and each of these was then 3d printed um uh in parts and assembled in my studio uh, before going off to be kind of cast or uh, have the molds made and then uh, cast in bronze so it, i suppose this process kind of uh alleviated that kind of need to do something i mean i suppose at this point i've spent quite a significant amount of time uh, looking at screen preparing uh, these works and there's always a kind of uh, nervousness especially when you're looking at something that's essentially 2d on a screen and actually having it uh, seeing it three-dimensionally for the first time um, it's, it's quite an exciting moment uh, sometimes um, so that was in my studio getting made um, and here's two other works from that series so Mars uh, on on the left and uh, Venus on the right. Now, uh, Venus um, is uh, the only female of the solar system. So I, I kind of thought she should be a very different uh, material from the rest of the, the sculptures in that series. Uh, so she was made in uh, marble, which was uh, CNC milled out in Carrara in Italy. And I kind of love the, I, I, I currently live in Glasgow uh, and I, I wish I could work in an environment like this. It's kind of uh, beautiful, these kind of uh, machines and the quarries. It's got a real kind of um, kind of juxtaposition uh, thing going on. It's, I, I find it quite stunning. Um, this is a kind of another process that I've used uh, as well which is looking at software which uh, uses simulation so this is a, a kind of uh, software called cinema 4d which ex uses physics uh, uh, to determine the kind of movement or um, 
kind of physical actions of an object. And in this case, I took a bust of a 3D scan of Plato, uh, which I 3D scanned myself, and he's then imported into this software. And I kind of create him as a rigid body, and into him is then poured uh, a series of uh, platonic um, solids, uh, which are kind of collider bodies, which kind of move around. And as they get poured in, they nestle and, and kind of make up uh, his kind of structure or his bust, I suppose, as uh, platonic solids. So that's Plato uh, made from platonic solids. And that as well was uh, cast in bronze for the Divine Principles series for Pangolin London. <clears throat> um, it was interesting what uh, Daniel was saying actually about kind of uh, finding or exploring things you don't know about and kind of technology that you don't know. I was uh, lucky enough to get a residency with the Scottish Ballet uh, in Glasgow <clears throat> for their digital season. Uh, and again, given a certain amount of time to, well, uh, basically hang out among the rehearsal spaces and propose a new body of work uh, to work with them. Now, I, I kind of initially thought that I would begin by 3D scanning ballet dancers. I mean, it's quite logical actually now that you, ballet dancers don't really stand still for very long and 3D scanning is not um, a kind of very practical <laughs> application for uh, working with dance. Uh, but one thing that uh, did start to look at was motion capture and how I could start to generate shapes and forms from kind of motion capture data extracted from the movement of the dancers. And these were some of the tests that I uh, did very early on. So this is kind of a line set between the two forefingers of the dancer, uh, which then extrudes uh, as it moves. And what I like about these processes is you can assign materials so you get a general idea of what these things look and feel like. Um, I'm just going to show you some of the background kind of uh, research that I did for that project but um, the whole project uh, resulted in a series of kind of objects uh, as well as images and the main kind of body of that was three um, uh, videos that were augmented digitally uh, with kind of I suppose special effects uh, that are all kind of uh, linked to the movement of the, the dancers. Uh, so for me it was a very kind of different um, environment to work within. I was kind of used to kind of very static uh, kind of sculptural things <clears throat> uh, and what I was trying to find with this was kind of something really sculptural that wasn't kind of static, something that was moving. Uh, and that's what I think digital technology uh, is really kind of interesting. Can can you can use um, uh, an uh, and explore it in a very interesting uh, way and apply materials and things like that. <clears throat> uh, kind of coming up to date now, I uh, over the kind of course of the last year during the pandemic um, have been working. With uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, software programmers uh, and got funding from Creative Scotland to develop a new body of work using artificial intelligence. <clears throat> uh, and these are some of the very kind of early uh, renders that are coming out from that project. Uh, it's starting to kind of bear more fruit now. Um, it's been quite a long, a long process, but it's really quite fascinating. Uh, and this is a kind of system whereby um, the Artificial intelligence is learning from a kind of database of 3D scans of classical busts. Uh, and I have, it, it, so it's starting to generate these shapes and forms uh, from that information that it's learning from. Uh, and these are some of the early renders where I've started to apply a kind of mirror like material um, because artificial intelligence for me it's always kind of projected as this kind of future technology but in reality what it's doing or what it's learning from is kind of historical information and that historical information can quite often be you know highly uh, corrupt or warped or just kind of hugely misinformed uh, so in effect artificial intelligence becomes this kind of uh, mirror that we kind of view ourselves through um, so that the kind of 
application of kind of glass or glass blowing, I suppose, and mirror seemed the kind of right process uh, to explore with some of these shapes. Um, and I am currently in the process at the moment of uh, 3D printing and casting some of these in preparation for glass blowing and mirroring um, uh, and actually making them in real life. Uh, and then there's kind of some other shapes and, and forms that are coming through. But what I kind of find really fascinating about a lot of these kind of objects is as humans in them, we can kind of see kind of uh, a certain body language. You know, you can take an individual one and look at it and go, you, you know, you can kind of get the sense of character from a fairly rudimentary uh, shape, depending on the kind of slump of the shoulders or the size of the head. And then you kind of assign a kind of masculinity or a femininity to it. So it's really fascinating that we're also bringing kind of more to these, or bringing a kind of a subconscious uh, knowing, I suppose, uh, to these shapes and forms. So that is uh, where I'm up to date, and hopefully within the next uh, year or so, I'll start to kind of be getting some of these out into some shows. So that's a kind of background uh, of a lot of my of a lot of my practice and how I work using different software. But if you can you can have a look at my Instagram and website, and you can see a lot more kind of uh, fuller side of my practice. Thank you very much. Amazing. Uh, Thanks, Zach. The the area of artificial intelligence and and its potential uses and abuses in sculpture is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of things that I, th I think that the three of you have had in common um, that it would be nice to tease out and hear a bit more about, I think. Um, but to begin with, um, thinking about sort of digital technology as a new thing, even though I guess I think about it as a new thing, even though maybe it's not a new thing, like digital technology has been with us for a very long time now, really. Um, it's developing, but we still think about it in a way that's kind of distinct from, again, to use the bunny ears, traditional sculpture. Um, so I wondered what are the differences for all of you between what we might think of as traditional ways of working and the digital realm? Um, and what do you gain from these particular technologies that you maybe wouldn't get if you were trying to make work like this in more traditional ways? Um, Alice, we started with you earlier on. So can we, can we throw these questions at you to begin with? Okay. Um... So there were quite a lot of questions there, but I think my first thought was just about hierarchies and um, trying not to work with hierarchies in mind. I was trying to talk a bit about this incredible word from Marsha Bjornaru, polytemporal. And I think also, especially in medium specific contexts, um, it can be a problem to think about tradition. Um, so yeah, I suppose I've been, trying to imagine that there isn't a hierarchy and that all of these things can exist as part of the sort of multiple births of a work. Do you feel like they're basically just tools? It's just like another kind of way of working? I suppose. Well, except that they do all have an aesthetic, that they are all visible, um, which is what I was trying to say in my talk. Um, you know, none of them are neutral. Yes, well, that, I think that's true of every material and every process, isn't it? That that nothing, nothing is neutral. Everything has this kind of baggage in some way, I guess. Um, Daniel and Zachary, how do, how does this work for you in terms of um, maybe hierarchies of materials and techniques? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm myself pretty against uh, any kind of hierarchy, I will say. But um, regarding the, the difference, you now working with a digital technology and, a, and a, let's say a more traditional one, uh, I mean it would be a bit redundant not to say that uh, that digital technologies are less physical, uh, but um, but they are also in let's say more subtle ways. Uh, there's there's um, I mean, I have the feeling that the, the, 
to me at least, no, I mean, that's probably also because I'm not a master in any digital technology, but uh, the, the manual technologies, let's say, uh, are more spontaneous and, uh, and their, their physicality, so how it speaks louder. So um, um, when, when you make a mistake, uh, it, it, it happens more naturally uh, and, and you, or whatever thing you know, you are molding clay, whatever incision you make, it is, is there, no one is there. And it's already give, guiding your finger to the, to, to, the, to the next movement, let's say. No? Um, so it's, it's somehow guiding, the, the matter itself is guiding the, the, the process, the, the, the output along the process. Uh, while uh, digital uh, tools to me, um, are narrower, narrower in the sense that they are they are designed, they are uh, designed to a specific function, and it's very difficult to use them in a different way than the uh, than the programmer uh, expected you to use them. No, so you are somehow um, um, there's an agenda. No, there's a bigger agenda in the in the in the digital technologies that comes to the programming, comes to the utilities. And um, so the same way you cannot drive uh, a car differently how it was designed to be drive, uh, the same happens with, uh, with uh, uh, cinema for pro <laughs> or, or, or any other. But, uh, but obviously uh, this is also because I don't know how to use these technologies properly myself. No? So um, probably when you are much better at them, you are you feel freer inside, no. Um, but I don't know. I think Zagari has much more uh, experience in, in in working himself with this. Uh, well, I, I I'm quite experienced with some software. Some of it I've been using for a long time. But I really like the experience of not knowing how to use things. So. Uh, and, and not really knowing what's expected of how to use certain kind of software and technologies. There's, uh, I quite like coming to something, uh, I don't know, like a, a song, there's a software called ZBrush, which is very uh, kind of malleable, I suppose, in terms of um, a materiality, let's say, because it is not material, but some software is very rigid and some, this, this works in a very soft way. And I, I have no idea how to use it, but somehow, I seem to get things out of it and a, a lot of it is trial for experimentation <laughs> um and and not limiting myself i think you know I, I have no expectations of myself so um yeah there's something kind of fascinating that happens when you don't know how to do something digitally that's a really interesting thing can we can i pick that up because that's something that alice you talked a lot about that it's not your job to be an expert and that, that Danny also you said you love to do things that you don't really know how to do and um, can you say a bit more about the this kind of experimentation and and what this allows you to do Alice can I pick on you first <laughs> yeah I think I was just thinking in relation to that just about disembodiment and um Disembodiment is part of embodiment. It's a feeling too. Um, and there's something about, um, you know, the question for me in making work always is how can I manifest different bodies in a sculpture? Um, and there's something about disembodiment that um, digital processes do particularly well. And I think um, there was a moment, both of the other panelists um, Daniel, you said at some point, then you realise you don't have a body in the VR. And I mm -hmm. thought, oh, that's to have a body and realise that there's a moment where you don't have a body is extremely strange. Um, and I was thinking about um, also this moment of when an object that um, has been scanned, for example, this kind of piece of bramble becomes digital information. And Zachary, you talked about this, the moment you know, there's a, there's a, during the multiple births of this, the sculpture that I made using a 10 centimeter part of this, it was digital for a long time. And that was also during the last year where life kind of became quite digital. Um, and then there was a moment where it kind of materialized and that's a huge change. 
in embodiment, a huge change in um, touch. Um, I always think of these things as kind of going through a series of filters, you know, they, they, you know, it's, it's an object that might get scanned and it becomes a kind of immaterial object. And it takes, it, it kind of goes through another filter then where it's either, you know, CNC'd or um, 3D printed. And then it goes through a kind of molding process, which is a kind of negative and then into a positive uh, and, and, and fluid and solid. Do you know, it goes through this, all these kind of um, uh, kind of filters, which each one leaves a different mark. Uh, and I, I find that kind of syntax quite interesting. But those marks are often seen as mistakes. So to go back to what Claire was asking about mistakes, you know, they're often in the context that I work, I see a lot of other sculpture being made. And most of that sculpture, you don't see the processes because at that point it would be a mistake. And that mm. really fascinates me. Yeah, I like I like the marks of the process. I, I mean, but it was always the same with me and ceramics. I like actually seeing the little scuffs or finger or kind of squelches of material. Like you know, it, it, it retains an honesty of process. Yeah, I I agree with that. There's a there's a um, when Alice was saying, no, like the, any monument is hollow, actually, you know. Uh, all, every horse, every every whatever, every general you yeah. have that is just hollow. You, know? you tap it, and but they pretend to be solid. They pretend to be to be massive. You no, know? and uh, yeah, also my body. There's a, a hole that goes all the way. Through, <laughs> you know? And this is full of holes. Like, yeah. Do you do, when you're working? One thing that's come across as well as the the kind of experimentation and the, the the way that you the way that you kind of don't know anything about it one thing that's clear is that there's a lot of human input into all of these processes um like digital technology seems kind of a bit remote sometimes but actually it's something that humans make work um and those kinds of marks and the 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 tool marks and the, the finger marks and everything. It's kind of, it seems like it's all part of this same continuum um, of, of making the making visible to, which is one of Lucy's favorite phrases. Um, can you say a bit more about the, the, about making in terms of the digital? Because this is something that really fascinates me and the kind of human input that all of you put into the work. Who can I pick on first? I have to pick on people. <laughs> I can I can go. Um, <laughs> the I mean to me, um, and this is something I was I, I was clear enough. But uh, when I when I was saying at that beginning, I started just working by myself with my own bare hands, uh, and then suddenly I started to need people to 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 help me. No, this is this is the reason. This is because they control the technology. I don't I don't control no. Um, Actually, the first time I started to work uh, with a team of people no, um, was when I did my first film. And then I realized that I needed a camera, I needed a sound engineer, I needed a, a producer. I mean, I needed a, a bunch of people no, to, to help me. And then I, I, this totally changed my, my, my way of uh, understanding my, my work or how I could develop my work. No? And then I started to, to collaborate more and more with other people because one of the most fascinating things that happened uh, is that all these people that came, you know, the sound engineer, the cinematographer, they came with, a, with an amazing uh, knowledge of their own disciplines. They have, uh, you know, like, obviously when you make a team, you, you try to do the best team possible, you know? but, um, but all these people bring another way of, of, uh, of thinking the, the, the very same work, uh, another way of finding solutions, another way of, uh, and all their, all their input is, it ends up uh, in the work, no? Uh, and so it's, it's also for me a very, very put, put in the most simple way I can, I can imagine. It's a, it's a, um, it's a faster way to learn, no? It's a, it's a, it's a way to learn more things, no? To get a little bit uh, outside uh, of yourself and or your own head. Um, but um, 
I was going to say something else, but they just just skip my mind, but it, it will come back eventually. I know, yes, they, that they, uh, this is also for me a way of um, of um, um, enhancing the vulnerability of the world, you know, or leave it, leave it open, leave it uh, more because, you know, I could say, oh, I want just a cube and the cube will be just, but I don't know, this just by, you um, Working with other people involves uh, listening to these other people. Uh, involves uh, leaving some parts of the of the process open up to to whatever it is. No, so this this aspect of uh, of um, making the work more vulnerable, more porous, or more uh, whatever you can uh, name, um, uh, this really interests me a lot. Did Zachary and Alice? Do you find this as well that? That those the processes are kind of generative, and when you when you're working with other people, there's a kind of that it becomes generative, and things take on their own life. Mm, I mean, much much of my work so, as a, is about thought processes. You know, uh, uh, for example, the the planets, the sculptures, the planets. That was that was really about, I suppose, uh, how people think about. I don't want to say religion, but it, mythology and religion, let's say, and factual information, like, uh, I mean, factual, unless you're a flat earther, maybe, uh, but factual information, like planets, that's scientific data, you know. So, and, and a lot, of, and the same with the AI stuff, it's about thought processes, it's about thinking and how, um, you know, things are kind of considered or, or digested. And, and one of the things that was really fascinating about uh, the Scottish Ballet Project for me, and it's, it's similar to Daniel, is making films and having and working with multiple people, cameramen, producers, um, musicians, dancers, choreographers. I was really fascinated about how different people think in different ways about the same thing. You know, I know I think in shape and form and objects and materials and things like that. I mean, kind of. The choreographers thought about kind of the body and movement and rhythm and, and musicians think about rhythm and sound and, and things like that so I, I i you know different people's inputs uh, is kind of really key and i think that's the same you know when you're working with a fabricator like a bronze foundry you know how something is um put together the process by which it's made is it's a, it's a similar kind of thing a kind of set of discussions I just wanted to add that this idea of digital technologies being somehow inhuman or kind of removing the artist can actually be really useful because for me, their inauthenticity, um, their artificiality, the way that we're kind of suspicious of them is useful because I'm not really interested in authenticity. Um, I want there to be um, artificiality in my work because it levels, it kind of... Um, it levels all of the um, origins. Um, you can't kind of, you can't pick a singular industrial origin, for example, if there's this kind of artificiality to the work. Um, and I think it's useful to try to remove the myth of the artist um, and all of the kind of the baggage that, that, that comes with that. So I've been grateful um, for that kind of aspect of it. But I think there's also this thing that I tried to, address when I was talking that maybe we expect some sort of progress, some sort of linear progress from mm -hmm. this idea of technology, whether we, we, we sort of can't help that, um, even if that's really clearly not the case. Yeah, I, th I think those are, those are two really, really interesting things that, and the, the idea of the mythology of the artist is something that's come up quite a few times during our discussions on fabrication. Um, particularly when talking to fabricators who kind of go, yeah, we're sort of complicit in that and kind of sheepishly admit that they facilitate this, this myth in some way. But actually, it's kind of crucial. And the, the idea of, I guess, the idea of authenticity is a kind of fiction in the first place, always has been, really. It's a really, really interesting area in terms of technology. Um, We've got a lot of questions coming in in the chat, so um, 
I think we, 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 I'm going to throw some of those in um, as well. Um, do any of you feel compelled to master any of these processes that you are collaborating with fabricators and other people on? I used to. I don't anymore. <laughs> I, I, I think that's because I cut because uh, I started in ceramics in a very kind of craft skill based arena. I felt like it, at the beginning it's very necessary to kind of master a software. But you kind of, for example, but very quickly you realize there's way more out there than you can possibly master. And the kind of range of skills necessary is huge. Um, so, no, I suppose over the last 15 years, that opinion uh, changed quite a lot. And, and I definitely seek out people who have uh, different skills and abilities to mine. And I'm, I'm guessing, Alice, from what you've been saying, that you you definitely don't feel compelled to become an expert or master. I think the, the idea of mastery is a really dangerous lie. And I think many of the great problems in the world um, at the moment stem from that. So, and of course, yeah, this is something that's, that's right in there in all those myths about artistic authorship and all of the interests that those serve. And yes, you come against come up against that really, really quickly. Um, as a young artist, um, and you, you work out what your position is, I think. Um, I, yeah, I want to work with materials and processes and people and forms. Um, and, you know, I'm moulded by all of those things as much as they mould, you know, it's, yeah, no. <laughs> mm. yeah. 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 Yes, for me, I mean, I, I likewise, um, I agree with both uh, Thackeray and Alice. Um, I, um, I don't want to master anything anymore, <laughs> even if I want it at some point. But um, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm really aware, or I try to be really aware all the time, is about the, the, the medium no, I'm using. And with this, I mean that... Uh, uh, I will. I will never do a sixty millimeters film just because it looks uh, like conceptual art from the seventies. No? <laughs> uh, I will. I'm, if I'm going to use a sixty millimeters film, like a short clip I show at the beginning, uh, is because I'm working uh, with and through the medium. No? And, um, and and the same applies to digital technologies. No, I will never use a digital technology for the sake of it or for the fascination because then it just becomes fetishistic. No, and um, and this is something I'm I'm always trying to to avoid as much as possible. That that's a really interesting point as well. And this is something I, I kind of wanted to pick up with all three of you really about this this. this the fetishism of the, the, the technology like is there ever a point where the technology the the, the process becomes more important and you start to like fetishize the technology is, is there ever a danger of that or am i like projecting again <laughs> no i guess it's true i mean when for example when i did the virtual reality piece uh, for the new museum um it was it was it, this is something you can get in any supermarket basically right now but uh five years ago six years ago and it's, it's amazing how fast it goes uh, there was no one that know how to do a uh, 3d scanning visible through a uh, virtual uh, reality glasses and then even have the people able to wander through this uh through this place, no, and no one knew how if it will work. Actually, not even the engineers from Oculus or the engineers from from OptiTrack. No? Um, but the, at the same time, everyone told me, "Okay, we have no idea who can help you, but I'm pretty sure that in a year and a half there will be hundreds of people able to help you." <laughs> and, and it's true; it's literally true, no. Um, but there was a, there was also a moment that. Uh, that the curator get a bit worried uh, because said, oh, maybe we are doing something that is so, you know, technological or so different that uh, that people will not get the work, will just get, uh, you know, entangled in the technology, will just uh, get, uh, will not get over the technology. And, you know, when, when in semiotics you say that for our sign to be readable, it needs to be transparent 
because if not, you get stuck in the opacity of the sign. So for example, when you see a Japanese lettering and you don't read Japanese, you only see the shape of the form of the sign. But when you read, uh, well, it just becomes transparent and you read the word and the meaning. Uh, with the technology, it had to, to happen the same. No? It needed to be transparent enough for people to go through it and, and reach the content, let's say, of the, of the work. And there was a, a big concern that people will just get stuck in the fascination of uh, wearing some virtual glasses for the first time. Uh, luckily, I hope, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it, it, this didn't happen, no? that the work was successful in this, in this sense, at least. I think for me, just like the idea of mastery, the idea of critical distance is also um, just a little, well, quite problematic and way too clean because I, I would always say that I'm always at least partially seduced by any material process or form that I'm working with. And that's part of being honest and also articulating complicity and complexity. Mm. I think from I, I I quite like I move on quite quickly. <laughs> I, I I kind of if, avoid kind of fetishizing certain technologies. Uh, in uh, uh, I get quite bored quite quickly. I want to do something different. I get excited by kind of other things, and and sometimes that is kind of new technology or a different material. Uh, I think it's similar to what Alice was saying. Really, you can't. Uh, avoid it in some ways, but you you, you kind of have to distance yourself in, in, in other ways. That's a, it's such an interesting discussion about the, like how involved you are with the technologies and like how how much you kind of invest in them and stuff. Um, there's a, a few questions relating to this kind of thing, um, especially about the kind of politics of materials and the politics of what you do. D Daniel, there's a, um, a question come in about um, your work with the Amazon and how much you're influenced by what's happening to rainforests um, and that kind of um the the how much of the politics fuels your work in that area? Um, a, a lot, <laughs> I have to say. I'm, I'm extremely concerned uh, about about the current situation here in Brazil. I mean, not only in Brazil, but in Brazil is probably the the, the main focus of attention of deforestation and everything, because we have such a criminal uh, government. Um, that is is just unbelievable. No? Uh, I don't probably you still don't know that, uh, but the um, the federal police has just started um, uh, an yeah an investigation on the on the Ministry of uh, of uh, Environment uh, for selling uh, the land uh, of indigenous tribes to to. To, to um, I don't know how to say that in, in English. Uh, the people that uh, take uh, um, the, the forest, the land to, to put cows, uh, basically. Uh, they, they are. And um, so they also want, uh, I mean, this is, this is not the Bolsonaro himself or I don't know, the Ministry of Development or something. It's the ministry that should be protecting the environment. He wants to legalize the illegal meaning of uh, gold. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah, I mean, I don't really know how to relate that to the topic of the, <laughs> of the, of the panel today. Uh, but, but yes, it really informs, uh, informs my, my my thinking, my practice, my concerns, and my my actions also as an artist, you know, and my future actions. The um, I was I was uh, I was just thinking uh, in the back of my mind right now that, uh, for example, with the uh, with the phantom, you no, know, with the uh, with the virtual reality piece of the of the forest, you no. Know, I, I for this work I, it's not the the Amazon exactly, is the the. Mata Atlantica, which is uh, is the coastal uh, rainforest of Brazil, that is the most endangered of of, of it all, and 
actually um, the fact of being digital and we are wary, we are being wary about this digital technology, as Elise was saying that uh, she likes to use that. Uh, this work was also using that because at the same time that it felt completely realistic and it had clearly, uh, um, let's say it was indexical in the sense that uh, there was there was a real uh, object that, we, that this can was taken from. Uh, it was in material, it was irreal. Then suddenly you kind of uh, um, were, were um, feeling the loss of this of this piece of forest, no? and uh, so I guess well, actually many many people came to me to talk uh, about this, uh, you know, like I, or or maybe people who wrote like about this work uh, being about this this forest that already disappeared or that is disappearing, even if this was not stated uh, anywhere, no. Uh, but people somehow felt you know, uh, that like if maybe in, if we continue at this space in uh, some decades, this will be the only record of uh, of what it feels to enter a rainforest. <laughs> Which is a, a kind of terrifying prospect. Yes, indeed. But I guess then the, the technology allows you to do something that's incredibly powerful in terms of bringing that message to people who would never otherwise have that experience and I think there's something really powerful about being able to step into that in the way that you could in that installation that that mm. you couldn't bring across in any other way I guess um that is a definitely a, a, a massive area to talk about. <laughs> but um, in terms of the kind of politics of things and the, the processes, we've had a couple of questions, especially for you, Alice, about like embodiment um, and about polytemporality and how for different types of bodies, different embodied processes, um, it's a bit... It, the concept of the Anthropocene and does that inform your processes? That Did one's you a bit more specific. Um, it is a question about geological time. Does the concept of the anthrop Anthropocene inform any part of your process, especially in terms of geological time, polytemporality, and for different types of bodies and embodied processes across species? Yeah, I guess I was. <laughs> yeah, that's quite thing. Um, I think that's too big to answer. <laughs> it, yes, maybe it is a bit. Um, I suppose I'm trying to expand. When I say that I'm trying to expand the category of the figurative, I'm trying to think with the body I've got, but beyond the body that I've got. Mm. and um, to extend it um, and in the hope that um, when the sculptures I make can be encountered in physical exhibitions, um, which is still what I'm working towards all the time, um, that you might be able to feel that too. Um, even something as simple as horizontality. Um, you know, we spend half our lives asleep most animals' bodies are horizontal all the time. Um, and yeah, I'm thinking about the two sculptures both titled Ammonite currently on display as part of Liverpool Biennial. They're a lot about horizontal kinds of embodiment. Um, and my big hope and ambition for them is that um, it might be possible to feel that um, for bodies that are mainly vertical when conscious. Um, when we're in the room with them. So, yeah, that would be my very um, roundabout way of answering that question. I, I don't have a research-based practice. I have an experience-based practice. So the best way to get an answer to that question is to go and see my work. It's an excellent answer. <laughs> um, there's um, another question about 
working with fabricators. Um, any thoughts on the tension between the public aura of digital work as super accurate or exacting and serializing and the artisanal nature of something like, in your case, that glass blowing? Um, so tension between the idea of the digital as very super exact or the the artisan nature of other processes? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I really don't like digital materials, let's say, like, for example, things that are 3D printed. I, I don't like the materials that um, uh, a 3D printer prints with, for example, filament or something like that it's a dead material to me and I, I i kind of really like natural materials like clay wood and i suppose uh, metal isn't yeah natural material um so yeah there's there's always going to be a kind of um a friction i suppose between trying to make something out of a material that um or trying to make something exacting out of a material that doesn't always want to be um, exact. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the things I always liked about clay. I, I, I kind of liked the idea that it was a kind of malleable putty like material, but I was trying to make hard edged objects, which I kind of fail at really because of the firing process and the material. So there's, there's a kind of, um, yeah, the exactingness is, is, I'm not looking for exacting really ever. <laughs> um, I, I, what I'm looking for is this kind of a strange friction between uh, something that has this perception of digitalness, but is made in something kind of uh, highly material and traditional in some ways. I don't like the word traditional, but as, I suppose, yeah, they are, these are traditional materials. And I'm trying to, I'm, I mean, I'm doing that physically, I suppose, in an object, but I'm also trying to do that kind of conceptually as well. Um, with how you think about it. It's, I mean, for me, it's very interesting now how the, um, how both uh, Alice and, and, and Zachary uh, work can come from something super uh, digital and then up um, in, in something that is uh, almost the oldest technique of making sculptures, no? the second mm. oldest, which is a foundry no? that exists for thousands and thousands of years. No? I, I, didn't, I never worked it myself uh, in a foundry. I mean, the only one was for these three in, uh, in Liverpool, but it was casted in concrete, not in bronze. But I know that it's a really uh, fragmentary process no? that involves a lot of energy, a lot of people, and a lot of time. Um, uh, consuming no so it's, it's for me it's really funny how you can jump from something really light like a digital file to something really heavy uh, as the as the, um, as the bronze uh, cast of, of aluminum cast of the piece no um but this also makes me think about uh how how we tend to imagine uh digital technologies as something immaterial uh but actually uh, when you learn that uh, a Bitcoin is consuming as much energy as Sweden uh, or, uh, or that um, Bolivia just suffer a coup d'etat uh, because their lithium reserves for, for batteries, uh, then you realize how digital are actually very, very physical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, those are real effects on real bodies. Yeah. Yeah, that, I guess that's that's quite an important thing to to note, really. That actually, all of these things are real. Like there is there isn't really this gap between the digital world and the real world. It, it's all real on some level. Um, I think digital digital is really a projection, right, from something that is physical. Mm -hmm. It's it's a kind of it is effectively like a projector. Here's what is projecting the information and how you see it or what it's projected onto is it is the kind of output, I suppose. And that output is, you know, ephemeral like light in some respects. I guess that's an, another interesting question about whether the, the, the technology is the material. Mm. Yeah, true. It has an aesthetic, you know, all these, all these kind of questions around perfection or accuracy, 
a kind of leaning towards some kind of invisibility, some kind of disembodiment. And I think what we're all saying is no. no. <laughs> you know, it, it's full of glitches, um, it's full of mistakes, um, just like any other process. I think it's, you know, finding what those are. But I also think there's a, there's a kind of belief in that this exactingness is kind of, or this idea of something exacting uh, is digital. Where, yeah, there, there are loads of glitches, there's loads of mistakes and kind of, you know, fuck ups. <laughs> you know? And these are kind of inputted by humans. It's, yeah. it's, it's not different from kind of humans. It is kind of created by them. And therefore it's got all these kind of flaws in it. Uh, that we recognise in ourselves. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Well, I, I mean, it, it, there's a. I think you're absolutely right that the idea that digital equals perfection is a total myth because anything digital is only as good as the human who's inputting into it. I guess, uh, mm -hmm. and you only have but to. Also, the people who built the program. Yeah, exactly. are built with agendas. They're built with certain kinds of bodies in mind. You know, there's a data bias. Um, this is written into it. And as you start to work with it, that becomes visible, whether you like it or not. <laughs> oh God, that's so... Mm -hmm. I mean, there was this this thing, no, that the iPhones, uh, when they started uh, being unlocked by 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 the face, uh, it just didn't work well with black people. So then suddenly it happens that the algorithm or, or whatever it is, is, is there's some racist bias uh, to it. Yeah. No? The iPhone is also built for the hand of a man, mm -hmm. you know, for a larger hand. Can mm -hmm. yeah. And this is the same for all tools, all processes, all technologies, all materials. They're, they're, they're built with certain bodies in mind. And this, this is one of the things that I'm exploring with the kind of AI stuff is that because all of this AI systems are learned from historical data, they bring all that bias with them, you know, whether that is kind of gender bias or racial bias or, you know, many other things. So, you know, that's something that's got to be factored into it in some respect. It's not a, it's not a kind of a clean system by any means. No, absolutely not. And uh, th there are so many examples of how those biases affect outcomes in like massive ways. And uh, in every sphere of life, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I think that's what always interests me, what are the awkwardnesses? Those are what I trust. Um, and I think that's where the art is. You know, it's the sand and the Vaseline um, that I'm looking for. Yeah. Oh God, that's a lovely way of putting it. <laughs> you have a really excellent turn of phrase, Alice. That was, yeah, such a, a perfect way of putting it. Um, well, it, our time is nearly up. Um, we're having a lot of questions about whether this uh, discussion will be available to view again, because people are, people are really fascinated by all of these questions that we've been thinking about. Yes, it will. It's been recorded this evening and um, it's going to be available on our website uh, and on Pangea's website in a couple of weeks' time uh, when we've properly subtitled it and bleeped out Zach's swearing. Uh, <laughs> in the meantime, um, I would really like to thank the three of you in the last few minutes that we have. Um, thank you so much to Alice Channer, to Daniel Stephen Mangrane, and to Zachary Eastwood Bloom. Thank you to Lucy uh, for helping us host. Um, final reminder that um, the next event in this series will be our In Conversation with Nicola Ellis on the 23rd of June. Uh, and we sincerely hope that all of you will be able to join us then. In the meantime, please check out the other recorded events on our website. Um, there's a whole range of wonderful discussions available from this series. Um, and also please check out all of the that we are putting out to accompany our current exhibition as well, which I have been asked to promote. 
the Portable Sculpture Exhibition at the Henry Moore Institute running at the moment. We've got loads of stuff online. Please take a look at it. But for now, thank you so much to Alice, to Danny and to Zach. Uh, and a good night to everyone. Thank you. For thank, you. thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.